character creation, I am going to plan and build a cleric to be used in the Curse of Strahd adventure. This will be a dwarven or hill dwarf, a female cleric who revers or worships the um, almighty Moradin. She is going to be a cleric with the domain of light. And I would think that not necessarily like the sun or something like that, but perhaps the light from the forge of the fires, kind of like a purge or, you know, a purging energy or something like that. I was thinking about making a life cleric, but a life cleric tends to be more bent on just healing. And although that would be very useful in, in a game like Curse of Strahd or some kind of horror type genre, uh, I think it's important to also have a little bit of firepower, so <laughs> no pun intended. But she's basically um, going to be uh, you know used in a setting like Curse of Strahd. She is a little bit biased towards that, only because I'm doing this tutorial. I'm going to use the character wizard to help us build this. And the reason for that is normally I use the drag and drop method, but I want to show uh, that it's a little bit quicker to use the character wizard. And if you're not familiar with Fantasy Grounds, I think it's a good start. It's not perfect. It does have its flaws, but, you know, so without further ado, let's get, get, get into this. So one of the things or the resources as a player and a GM is that there is a quick start guide for players. So if you go to the Atlassian guide, and this will be in the video description, but it kind of goes through everything. It kind of shows you what's what. It gives you a pretty good rundown of, of how to build a character in Fantasy Grounds. So what we're going to do is do a little bit of planning. I'm going to use the um, chat GPT AI tool, but you can use D&D Beyond or perhaps just write it out on paper as to what you want to build in Fantasy Grounds. I think this helps a little bit in regards to choices and, you know, that sort of thing. Because if you're new to Fantasy Grounds, you're already going to um, basically be a little bit lost. So, you know, initially I think it's good to have a plan. Um, after you get familiar with Fantasy Grounds and you get used to it, you can probably just go in there and do it. But I think this will really help um, new players and people that are, you know, still on the fence about using Fantasy Grounds. So without um, going into that too much, I want to um, go into the actual um, NPC here or the player character. <clears throat> so this is Hilda Stoneheart. She's a hill dwarf, level three, light domain cleric, clan crafter background, lawful good. Her deity is more than the soul forger. It already kind of gives me an idea of her stats, including the hill dwarf bonus. And this also calculates in her total hit points. And then it kind of gives me an idea of how that worked out. And then her proficiencies. So she has light armor, medium, shield, medium armor and shields. Simple weapons, she's also Warhammer because she has a Dwarven racial trait. Smith's tools and brewer supplies for being Hill Dwarf. Her saving throws are based on wisdom and charisma. She has insight, religion, history, and persuasion. Uh, she's got some gear, light armor. Let's see, she's got chainmail, a Warhammer, two light hammers for throwing, and a sling for long range. She's got the ammo for that. Holy symbol and holy water. She's got some artisan tools, smith tools, a letter of introduction from her guild, traveler's clothes, and a belt pouch. Uh, she has a helm, rations, water skin, potion healing, and a pouch with 15 gold. Uh, so basically, this is kind of planned out to where when I go build the, the character, it's not going to take as long. And this talks about her class features and her starting spells and, and free cantrips and such. And then her background feature and light domain features. She has a warding flare. Um, and then she has some spells that are prepared. So I'm going to pick these spells out. And then for her personal details, it talks about what she looks like, her personality. So she's short in stature, just over four feet. Just deep chestnut brown hair, intricately braided with gems and metal clasps, bright blue eyes, meticulously clean and polished chainmail armor, and the holy symbol of Moradin. Uh, she's compassionate, dedicated to her craft and faith, a bit stubborn, and a dry sense of humor. 
Uh, her role in the Curse of Strahd is she's going to try to be like the beacon of hope in Barovia, fighting against darkness and despair, using her skills and divine powers to decipher mysterious and, uh, mysteries and challenges. So she's kind of uh, accompanied a human bard named um, Alaric to Barovia. She kind of got roped into this. Uh, she was basically inspired to fight against Strahd von Zarovich's t tyranny. Uh, provides healing and solace. Her enchanted crafts are symbols of her resistance. Uh, her glowing warhammer is also known uh, is a known sight against Strahd's minions. Uh, Hilda's presence is a mix of traditional dwarven culture and the divine mission of the light domain. In the grim setting of Barovia, she stands out as a figure of hope and resilience. So she focuses on support and healing. She usually utilizes her light-based spells to damage and disorient foes, employs her warhammer and light hammers effectively in close combat. Uh, she hopes to restore Barovia, confront Strahd, and find a way to lift the curse from the land. So this is kind of the, you know, her her base layout here for the character. And um, ChatGPT kind of laid this out in rather quick order. So if you're somebody who already has this, this would help. Um, just kind of get a rough idea of what you're going to build, um, especially in Fantasy Grounds. So I'm going to go ahead and go into the program, and I'm going to start building using the character wizard. Now, one of the things that you want to keep in mind as a player or GM is that you need to have your sources open first. So before you start the character wizard, it's helpful to have all the books activated. And if you're the game master, you need to share the books with your players. So that's important. So before they even initialize the the uh, character wizard, you want to have those available to them. If you don't, if you open it up halfway through the character creation process, it may not pull in the, the other options. So that's something to keep in mind. And just remember that the character wizard is not perfect. It is an active maintenance. Like they're updating it every week. I just saw three or four updates with little things that people found that weren't calculating correctly. So it's a work in progress. It's never a one and done thing with the character wizard because there's so many variations and things that can go wrong that they are constantly working on it. He hasn't done anything major because it's kind of in a lockdown, but I know that he has bigger plans for it going forward. But I don't know when that will happen, probably after the next uh, major update. So let's see what we got here. So we got all our books loaded. The main thing is having the player's handbook, but you know all these other things are supplemental. I also have the Curse of Strahd player's book loaded here just in case. Uh, I have the uh, Van Richten's guide, so if there's any themed stuff from Barovia or from the, the setting, those will be open, like backgrounds and such. So I'm going to go ahead and um, open up the character wizard. So it's over here on the right under player, and you want to click on characters. And you have a choice. You can either create a, a sheet, which will be a starting point. You'd use that for like drag and drop, or you can click on the character wizard. So I'm going to do that. And in this case, the character wizard doesn't really matter what order you build your character in. And that's one of the nice things about it is that you can start pretty much anywhere in the character creation process. Whereas in drag and drop, you got to do the ability scores, background, race, class in that order to make sure everything calculates properly. So we know that she's a dwarf, so we're gonna click on, on dwarf. And then once you do that, um, you can decide like, you know, what, what your ability score increase is. So according to our plan, we got the plus two in con. And then um, the age and all those sort of things, I'm not gonna mess with that too much. But we're gonna make her a, Shield Dwarf, I believe that's a, a, here we go, Hill Dwarf. So we'll click that. That's basically her, her thing. So she gets a plus two in con. And then she gets a tool proficiency. And according to our plan, I think we had Smith's tools as our first choice from the actual um, build. And then as, those are the choices, essentially. But if you wanted to change a race, you can click up here on top, or you want to change the sub race, you can click there. So you're, you're not dedicated or locked in. Whereas if you use the, the drag and drop method, once you drag over the race, it calculates everything, puts it on the character sheet, and then you're kind, it's kind of a done deal. You can't really fix that very easily. So with this, it hasn't committed yet, but it is in the queue to be 
to be kind of like hold until you uh, click commit on the on the end of the character process. So when you're creating a character at the very end, you commit to the changes. If you're going to build a character um, in the character wizard, it commits at the very end and you don't have to worry about going back and making changes. But in the drag and drop method, you, you definitely need to um, commit. So the next thing is class. So we're going to go ahead and pick the, the cleric. And then if you, uh, in this case, I could uh, bring this up to level three because that's the, the basically the, the level that I'd like her to be in. And then I'm going to click the divine domain for her. So in this case, uh, it's going to be the light cleric. So she has the light domain. And then for proficiencies, uh, let's see, choose. So I think she has religion and the other one was persuasion, I believe. Yep. And it will, if you don't, um, if you double up on your skills, this won't let you as easily. If you use the drag and drop method, it's easier to get that wrong because it's not going to tell you that you need to pick something else. So that's that's the thing about this. So this class thing will not be satisfied until you make that. So you got the specialization as a light domain. There's a spell casting um, trait. There's the warding flare. Channel divinity. You get the uh, turn undead and, and the warding flare. And then radiance of the dawn is another channel divinity. And then there's some light domain spells that you'll be um, granted without having to do your, these don't count against your daily or your uh, spells known. They're kind of always prepared, so you don't have to prepare those. All right, so let's see what we got wrong here. So it's saying not that it's not happy yet. Uh, let me go to spells. Okay, this is where you pick the spells. Okay, we can do that shortly. Uh, so let's see. So religion and persuasion. Maybe I'll try history. No. Huh. We'll have to come back to it. So I must be missing something here. Let me uh, collapse this, collapse that. What is it not? Okay, yeah. Okay, divine domain, spell casting. Let's see. Let me go to the spells. Maybe that's what's holding it up. All right, so there was some freebies in there. So you can go to cantrips. And if I go to my um, planning sheet here, I know I had light is a free one. That comes with your domain. And then there was two others that I wanted to pick um, from the spell list. So that was, let's see. I wanted to get... Let's see spells prepared okay so cure wounds is a free one guiding bolt shield of faith healing word and bless so some of those are freebies so but i wanted to look at the uh, cantrips okay, that's your bonus cantrip there's the spells prepared um, okay, so Guidance and Sacred Flame were the other two. So I want to grab those. So Guidance, Sacred Flame, and then I'm going to click over to um, the other spells. Let's see, so that's that's the cantrips. Now I'm going to click on, on this level one, and we're getting Bless, Cure Wounds. I think there was Guiding Bolt. Let me look back at that. So kind of building it the way it was set up here on this guide here. So Guiding Bolt, Shield of Faith, Healing Word, Bless. Okay. So Guiding Bolt, Healing Word. We already have Bless. So I think we're good there. And now the second level, I'm going to look at that list again. Man, let's see. Lesser Restoration, Prayer of Healing. Okay. So... Prayer of Healing and Lesser Restoration. And there are a couple other, I think Continual Flame is one of them. I got to look. But that's one of your bonus spells from the, the actual class. Let me check that out. 
So, Sacred Flame, Burning Hands, Fairy Fire. Okay, that's that's what it is. So let me check that. So I want to um, just kind of search for these. See if it if it'll let us search. Yeah. So what I'll do is when I'm done, I'll go back and add those later, because those are not in the. Uh, yeah, these are not necessarily in my uh, foray here. So these are spells that are granted from my domain, and they're not normally in cleric. So when the when the uh, when the character is being built, sometimes you have to add things on later. Uh, depending on th how the character wizard's working, but essentially you just go back in after it's set up and, and pick them. It's not that big of a deal. So it can't capture every single instance, every single choice. And those spells are typically not in the same um, class. Those are like wizard spells or something like that. So they won't effectively show here necessarily unless you were a split class or something. So I'll go back to those, no big deal. Uh, okay, so abilities. Now this is where you can change this up. So you can use your um, dice, manual entry, point by, or standard array. So that's basically the, the choices that you have. So standard array gives you 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and eight. And then this shows your base scores here. And then up here are the adjusted scores. Race has given me a plus two on con and plus one on wisdom. And then you have ability score increases at fourth level. There's some miscellaneous adjustments. Maybe your GM is going to give everyone a plus one to add to one of their ability scores, you know, whatever. And then there's the override. So if you already have all your stats figured out, you don't even have to do this. You can just type it in here and that overrides everything. So I'm going to take a look at my cheat sheet here and see what we had for that. So up here we had 12, 10, 16, 10, 16, 8. So 12, 10, 16, 12, 10, 16, 10, 16, 8. Okay. Twelve, ten, sixteen, ten, sixteen, eight. Okay, so these will override everything in these columns. So if you want to just plug some numbers in, if you're, let's say you already created the character, or, or maybe you're copying a character over. That's an easier way to do that. So this base is what you start with, but then you have your adjustments here. But since I have the um, character already planned out, I'm using those. All right, so we go to background. Uh, she's a clan crafter, so go ahead and add that. And proficiencies for tool was a brewer supplies, I believe. And then for language, she's got uh, dwarvish, so we want to give her common. Well, she knows Dwarvish already. Is common on here? No. So I'm going to give her probably giant speak. There we go. And if she has respect of the... And let's see, we're given history and insight. So I'm going to go back to this, um, which was... And go to her features. And we have religion and we have persuasion. Choose life light. We already did that. So we wanted to pick the light domain. Okay. I don't know what's wrong with that, but we'll find out. It's something's not quite right here. So religion and persuasion. We got that. We got the spells pretty much. Yep. And we got the free cantrips. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm missing. It's something to do with the specialization. I don't know what's what's hanging it up, but we'll find out. 
Okay, so equipment is basically you can do a starting kit or starting wealth. So if you want to spend the time with your GM buying equipment, onesie twosies, you can do that, or you can select a kit. So in this case, I will have the brewer supplies, a uh, warhammer, chainmail, because these are things that she was going to have, light hammer, and then it's priest pack, and we wanted a holy symbol. And if you were going to add items, you could do so at this time. So I want to add some items. So I'm going to go with a pouch. Because I don't know what that if what that comes with. And I am going to give her a potion of healing. So I'll say healing. Just one. I don't think that's too overpowered. And then I think um, a helm. I should wear a helmet. I guess it's not on the list. But nonetheless, this is just a way you can add things if you need to. Uh, holy water. I think that was the other one. Holy symbol, holy water. So we got a flask of holy water. Okay. And then the light hammer. We got that. We got that. Okay. No problem. Now, I got to figure out what I've done wrong here with this. We got the bonus cantrip. So you already know light. We have the domain spells, divine domain spells. Each spell, maybe it's because I haven't picked the spells. Uh, let me drag those on there. There we go. So, yeah, we get Scorching Ray and Flaming Sphere at third level. So let me go back to here. Go to spells. <laughs> now I have to add those later. So features. <clears throat> That looks right. So something's going on here. If you don't, if you have a domain that doesn't appear in the cleric list, the spell is nonetheless a cleric spell for you. So that's basically what I'm coming across. So here are the scan trips. Wonder why it's not letting me. Huh. So if I go into this commit warning, select level zero divine domain choice so it's giving me the reason right here so divine domain choice oh, oh 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 okay i think it wanted me to there we go right here divine domain okay so i'm going to go into see here's the light domain i don't know why it's not not recognizing that but that's basically what i chose so it's not letting me um so i can remove it but it's not allowing me to select it which is really strange domain spells we already got that yeah, it's not recognizing. Let me try a different one just to see if it if it changes. Let me try the life domain. Yeah, it's still doing that. So something's goofy going on with this, but let me close that and go back to class. Go to cleric. Go to proficiencies. Let's see. We wanted persuasion, I believe, and religion. And then we're going to go to the Divine Domain, and that was Light. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So this is what I'm saying. Like, sometimes these character wizard things can get a little goofy. Uh, it depends on, you know, like, what's, what's happening. But this may be a known issue. I haven't checked it yet. But nonetheless, if you don't have that, I don't know if it'll let you commit, but it's saying Divine Domain Choice. So let me save it. And let's see what happens. So let's go with, 
Oh, it's still I see. It's level one. That's why. Got it. So it it didn't like the idea that I went up to level three without that choice, because you do it at level one, and I was I already jacked it up to level three. So that's what it was. So if I go to level up, yeah, see it picked it here. So if I go to level up, then it will it'll do it better. Yep, there we go. There's your channel divinity. So that's all it was. It's because I skipped the steps of leveling like a normal character build. It kind of goofed it up. So this is Hilda Stoneheart. So that's a good thing to know. Um, is that if you pick something... Uh, and you, and you try to start off right away at fourth level. It's it kind of gives you a hard time. So it's designed to go up incrementally, not not to start off at level three. All right, so let's do that again. So I'm I am going to go to level three, but I'm going to do it incrementally. So you click on the level up button here. So I clicked on this magnifying glass under class and level, brings up this pop up window, and then click level up again. And you click on the level up button, and then it gets into your your divine domain spells, and we'll hit commit, and then save. There we go. So it worked. It's just that I'd kind of jumped the gun instead of doing it incrementally. So if I hadn't played around with it like that as much, I would have definitely taken me probably about 10 minutes less than it normally would with a character build using the character wizard so that's kind of cool it it it's just kind of something that you got to get used to i'm used to doing the the drag and drop method and that's something that um i'm more used to and one thing about the drag and drop method is that it will give you grief <clears throat> if you're not used to fantasy grounds so like i said it'll double up your skills here it won't tell you if there's a conflict there and then also, um, when you drag over your background, race, and class, you're committed at that point. And the other thing is, is that you know you're manually adding everything yourself. This is something I don't care for, but I understand why they did this. So when you first build your character, this is the actions tab. It's going to give you every single thing under the sun here. And, and so what you have to do is go in and edit these out. And it is pretty annoying because there's quite a few that you have to get rid of. So I'm going to keep warding flare because that's part of my, and channel divinity for turn undead. So those are both part of my um, domain. So those are the two that I get for this particular build. So that's just kind of something that you'll have to manage after the fact. Cause they, it's either kind of all or nothing and in this case, it's going to be nothing if you, unless you accept that part of it. So let me see if I got this right. So sacred weapon review. Who gets radiance of the dawn? Let's see what that is. Cause I don't remember. Huh. I don't think that's part of my domain. I'll double check. Yeah, it is. Channel the Vidi, Radi Radiance of the Dawn. So I don't need the undead thing because it's part of it. Wait, as an action, you say at second level, you can channel energy from your deity to fuel magical effects. You start with two such effects, turn undead and then an immediate. Uh... Okay, so I actually got three. Oh, that's pretty cool. So this one, you're kind of getting three here. Warding Flare is kind of part of your thing here. But you have this Turn Undead, Radiance of the Dawn, and Preserve Life. We don't have that. That's a different... Okay, there we go. So there's your two. There's the Dwarven stuff that comes from your race. And if you have a, a Hill Dwarf, you normally get an extra plus one bonus to your armor class that's already baked in the fantasy ground so you don't have to adjust for that so that's already been calculated in the total max hit points uh, these look correct i think what i would do here is redistribute this but 
this is fine for, for just the demonstration. But then you have all these things. So what I normally do in this case, after you, I'm going to select a picture for now because I don't have a, I don't really have a good um, portrait ready to go. I mean, I have something made, but so Fantasy Grounds Fantasy. And you'll notice that when you click on these, it, it'll take you a few minutes to to bring up the list because it's got to scan through the library and build the preview thumbnails. That's why it takes so long. I think I'm just going to use this one for now. That'll work. And then as far as this stuff goes, let's see. Yep, so that's all correct. This is all correct. And let's see, bonus cantrip. So we got that one was light. I just put a little notation there. So there's the light domain spells, which is something I needed to look at because I'm going to add those to our list, make sure we have those. And then we already have warding flare. Yep. Looks like we got most everything here. So the languages are there. So these are the kinds of things I want to look at. Uh, let's see. There was one other thing, I believe. There was like a dwarven... Um, oh, the Smith's Tools. Yeah, Smith's Tools right here and Brewer Supplies. So what I'm going to do is add these manually. So I'm going to click on the Skills tab and click the Screen Plus button a couple times. Add the proficiency to it by clicking on the star. And what we're going to do is put the brewery thing here, which you probably never use, but we're going to do that. And I'm going to base it off of wisdom. And then we have our Smith's tools. So if you're going to repair or assess armor or something like that, that again will be a wisdom type thing. So this would rarely happen, but what's nice about doing this is that it will already include your ability score adjustment and your um, proficiency bonus. That way you don't have to do it manually. So if you have any skills that aren't on here or proficiencies that would require a row, a roll, then you can definitely um, add those here. That makes it a little bit more convenient occasionally during gameplay. So these are all the actions that belong to this character. Now we're going to add the spells. And the reason why the other spells didn't um, add, because I went back and adjusted it. So that's what happened there. So what I'm going to do is go into the spells area under the character creation part, under character, pull up the spells. And if you have your content loaded, you'll notice all these different spells. Right now it's showing every single book that I have loaded. Uh, there are some filters to kind of help you with this so you don't have to look at every single spell. So down below, I'm going to pick level zero. And then source, I'm going to pick cleric. And that's essentially a way to kind of narrow down your choices. You're not looking at every single thing. So I believe that this particular character was guidance, light, and sacred flame okay so those are the cantrips they automatically get put into the correct area if you drag them to where it's a spell slots they'll drop where they need to go you don't have to drag them to a, a pre-ordained section uh the the items that they get for their first level bonus spells like these four i'm going to put those in their domain area so those will go up here so for domain spells we're going to go to level one. Let's see, they get burning hands. So I'm going to search. I got to um, unfilter it because I got to search for it. It's not a common spell. So I have to take it off cleric. Otherwise, it won't show up in my search. So burning hands is one of the domain spells. So instead of putting it in the regular spells, I'm going to put it in the cleric area. So I can kind of differentiate, you know, what's the domain spells and what isn't. And then fairy fire. So that's going to go in the domain spells as well. And then flaming sphere. So I'll just do sphere. And take the level off of it. Sphere. Flaming sphere. And scorching ray. 
Okay. So those are the domain spells. Those are kind of, I wouldn't say freebies, but essentially they are. So flaming or scorching ray is going to go up here. Okay. So now that we have that, what I can do is collapse these down so it's not expanded because that, that can throw you off. And one thing, if you have spells in two different areas, like I do, uh, you want to make sure that it's based on the correct spell. So in other words, under this cleric action and effects, all this stuff is going to be based on wisdom. So I want to click on that and change the ability score to wisdom. That way it will pull in your bonuses, if anything, like your saving throws and all that stuff. So if anything has a saving throw, it, it will pick up the bonuses if there are any. So that's just kind of a, a way to make sure that it's picking up the correct uh, stat in this case. And now I can just pick spells without worrying about the bonus spells. And I don't want to repick the ones that I already have. So I go ahead and um, go back to level one and then source is cleric. So I'm going to go with bless. That's a very useful spell. And this is going to just go in the regular spell list. Uh, Guiding Bolt is a good one. Um, let's see. Healing Word. And maybe one other. Uh, Shield of Faith is probably the last one. Okay, so that's for first level. So these are the ones that I prepared. The other ones are automatically prepared. I don't have to prepare those. But these would be prepared... And then the second level spells, I'll select the level two. And I will go to Spiritual Hammer. That's always a good one. Uh, War Zone of Truth, Continual Flame. I will do that because it seems kind of themed for her, uh, uh, for her domain. And then maybe Prayer of Healing. So those are the the main spells that I have that I have in my loadout, as we call it. So those are the prepared spells. So you can have any number of spells here, but you can only prepare so many a day. So I just picked the top spells that, that I would use. But this is just kind of a preliminary to show you how, that, how, to, how to add those. And by doing so, um, what, what you do here is if you go into, if you're a wizard, let's say, and you go into preparation, you can click on your prepared spells. So we're going to do Spiritual Hammer, Prayer of Healing. Uh, we're going to do with Bless, Guiding Bolt. You can prepare up to six. So let's see, one, two, three, Healing Word, and we'll do Shield of Faith. So all the other ones are automatically you know, prepared, and you don't have to do anything with them. But these ones you do. So I've got those six prepared. And then I just go back to combat and actions. And that's essentially what you want your character sheet to look like before you start. Now you can add a lot of other things to the, your character sheet, especially in these actions, if you kind of know what you're doing. So what I want to do is show you something, a little bit of uh, extra. So this kind of goes above and beyond what's required. All right, so this particular case, this cleric has, let's see, if I want to go to their equipment. Okay, so we don't have all the inventory yet, so I want to go to, I'm going to load up a, a module that I'd recommend if you've uh, kind of got a little bit more familiar. So um, under the modules section, I'm going to load up a very helpful module. This is the uh, Rob Tui's background and equipment. So background and equipment. Oops. That's equipment. So what this is, is essentially these are bundles of items that are for your first level characters. So what this does is it eliminates having to drag and drop everything over manually. So what I will do is take this, I'll get rid of that pouch. I don't need that. And then go into the parcels. And your players can do this if you share the module with them. But essentially use this drop-down list. And you want to click on the uh, background bundles. So for the, this is a uh, clan crafter. So you can drag that. That gives them their background equipment for the clan crafter. 
and then you can pick the class. So if we come down here and go to the next page, you'll have the starting equipment for the cleric. So you can drag and drop that in there. Now this only gives you the, the set A, so you may not like this. Like scale mail is not what she has. She has actually chain mail. So I'll get rid of that. So scale mail. And then for weapons, let's see, what does she have? See, this gives you a mace. So we're going to give her a war hammer. And everything else looks okay. Like, the, you know, all the rest of the stuff could just be uh, just extra stuff. So this is a, kind of a way to make that process a little faster. Otherwise, you're going to go to the items list and search for every single thing and have to drag it over. So it's very tedious. So that's a helpful module. That's on the DMs Guild if you guys are interested in it. It's not very much money. It's like five bucks or less. It's definitely worth it for a time saver. Let's see, Warhammer. It's a, one of the, I had the idea and then Rob kind of made it. Uh, he built the module and put it up on the DMs Guild about, about five years ago. It's been pretty handy. So Warhammer, Chainmail. Because I was doing a lot of character creation classes and it was annoying because you have it, that would be like half the class or the half the lesson there was taking all that stuff and dragging it onto your character sheet. It's good to go through the motions to kind of get an understanding of how this works. But once you've done it a few times, you should, shouldn't have to do it 50 million times. So the other thing you can do here with your equipment is organize it. So you notice here I have backpack. It says empty, and that's because everything's kind of expanded out. So I'm going to get rid of the word empty. I'm going to backspace, just delete all that, including the space behind here. And then everything that's going to go in the backpack with a capital B, if I just start to spell it there, it's going to put it in that container. So the amulet's going to go into a, a pouch, which is probably my holy symbol or something like that. Uh, even though the blanket's not necessarily in the backpack, it's probably tied to it. My brewer supplies, candles, anything that's not a weapon or armor. So there's that. There's a chisel. There's my um, vestments, which is kind of like your robes and stuff for religion. Uh, the gem is going to go into my my pouch. And then I have uh, some rations, so that's going to go in the backpack. And what you'll notice is they'll kind of nest underneath, kind of indent. And that's uh, kind of a way to organize your inventory. And then once you're done, you just click anywhere. You don't have to hit enter or anything like that. And they'll kind of sort where they where you place them. So the traveler's clothes. Okay, so the holy water is going to go in the pouch. And then I thought I had a potion. Yeah, so it says potion here. So let me. Yeah, it may not be identified. There we go. Potion of healing. So that's going to go in the pouch. There we go. So sometimes when you get potions that are not identified, and you have to go in there and allow that if you're if that's the case. I'm going to up the food a little bit to five days instead of just two. Ten candles, that's fine. Some some clothing. So I want one more thing. Uh, I was going to have a sling, but we're going to have crossbow bolts and a light crossbow. So if you're very meticulous and organized, you might want to grab a case for the bolts. So they're not just bouncing around in your backpack. So there's a crossbow bolt case. And then you would put your crossbow bolts. It's not kind of like having a quiver, essentially. The crossbow bolts are going to go in the case. So you put the container name over here on the right and spell it with a capital letter. The nice thing about this is if you were to drop the backpack, let's say. So if, if you're not carrying the backpack any longer. Right now, my current weight is 120. So if I unequip the backpack, it's going to be 78. When I go back to put it back on as carried, it's 120. So you kind of manage your weight. It depends on your GM. Your, some some game masters don't care, but if it means a, a difference between you jumping across a ravine, uh, getting you know getting rid of uh, you know 40, 50 pounds is quite a significant amount of weight. 
So that might be something that, you know, at least be able to tell, like, okay, if we're going to jump across a ravine, if I get rid of my backpack, I can get the full length. But if I have my backpack on, maybe it's a, a more difficult challenge to jump across a, a, a ravine, especially being a dwarf, short legs and all. Uh, so that could mean the difference between success and failure. Who knows? Um, one thing to note is the shield. So in this case, if you are a shield bearer, someone who uses a shield and you're not uh, have a specific proficiency with it or anything like that, um, you get a plus two armor class automatically because it's equipped. So if you're going to use a weapon that's two-handed, such as the crossbow or the warhammer in this case. So did I give? Yeah. So that's a two-handed weapon if you're going to use it um you know, to do more damage, or if you have a two-handed sword or you're using a bow or something, you're not supposed to necessarily benefit from the shield. So if you go over here to your um, main tab, you look at your armor class, so open the magnifying glass, this tells you where all your bonuses are coming from. So we're getting six from the armor itself, getting two from the shield, no dex bonus in this case, because our dex is low. And then these would be if you're a monk or a barbarian, and then it may be a miscellaneous adjustment, depending. So this is kind of the where that formula is coming from. So what I'm going to do is create an effect that's going to offset that. So first of all, I want to um, add my ammo. The unarmed strike is just there in case you want to punch somebody. And the warhammer is, is versatile. So if you look this up... Versatile, meaning that if you want to use it with two hands to do more damage, you get a 1d10 instead of a 1d8. But there you would change your handedness, which will add that extra damage. However, you're not supposed to necessarily benefit from having the shield bonus. So to make it easier, so you don't have to go back to your sheet and adjust it from there, the bonus, you can go ahead and adjust it here. So I'm going to make a new group. So I'm going to click on Edit List and click on the star, which it says Add Power. We're not really adding a power per se, but we are adding a new group. So if we change this mode down here to Group and keep the mode standard display group, on the right-hand side, I'm going to say just say um, Standard Actions or something like that. So this is nothing special, it's just a way to, to name it. So it's no longer be Powers. So if I click somewhere, now it's down here under powers. So what I'm going to say is uh, drop shield, I guess, is the best way to to describe it. Drop or, or, or remove shield. So you could, you know, put it away, whatever. So that's just a note. Now I'm going to right click on it, go to add action and come down here to add effect. So all I'm going to do is add a note and then the actual effect. So for targeting it's going to be self and then we're going to put we're going to put um remove shield as the description with a semicolon and then ac colon minus 2. So all that does mathematically is cancel out your shield bonus. So I'm going to go back to this mode and change it to preparation and then combat and then display as action. So I'm going to put the character on the combat tracker. And what happens is when you enable this, it puts it up here in the combat tracker temporarily. And then once you're done, if you put your shield back on or whatever, you change this back to single handed use. And then you can come up here under effects and remove the shield drop. Uh, it's kind of like a penalty. But basically it cancels out the shield bonus. The only thing it doesn't take care of is the weight. So the right way to do it is to actually come back here and unequip it to where you're not carrying it. And that'll take the weight off. However, in the heat of battle, you don't want to do that. And you're always on this screen. It's so much easier just to cancel the shield bonus out. Uh, in most cases, the weight's not going to matter. So that's just a tip that you might learn over time for characters that have a shield and they're going to try to use a two-handed weapon. So the same thing with this crossbow, it's two-handed. 
So you're not able to use your shield when that happens. So you should have a way to either unequip it or cancel out the shield bonus. So that's kind of very specific to this character. But you might come across that with a warrior or something like that. There could be a feat or some kind of special ability where you're able to still use the, the shield. But 99% of the time, no. All right, so that's just kind of your basic building here with the little extras. Now, one thing I like to do as a game master and a player also is sometimes I'll keep track of my inventory. So I'm just going to look for the consumable things. So food, water, candles, and the potion, and the holy water. So what we're going to do is make another group. So this is not necessary. This is kind of going over the top, but nonetheless, it's something that you can do. So if I click on edit list, click on this add power, it's going to add another group. I'm going to get out of the edit mode by clicking on edit list again, and then switching this over to standard, and then the display is group. And I'm going to call this um, consumables. So this is just a way for me to keep track of what I've used. So consumables, now it's a new group. So I'm going to add a few entries by clicking on this green plus button. And this is going to be where we add potion and stuff. So healing, potion. Uh, we're going to have water skin. You got candles. Uh, there is your rations. And then we had holy water. So these are things that you will use throughout your adventure and you can kind of keep track of at least what you're using. It's not attached to the inventory unless you get, there is a, an extension that will do it. But under the actions here, under this, this consumables, I'm gonna go to preparation mode and plug in the number of these that I have. So I have 10 candles. And then I have one healing potion one vial of holy water. I have five days worth of food and water skin is usually one or two days. So I'll just put one there. And then these will not necessarily replenish unless you go to the store or something. So I change these to once and that'll set up the little usage bubbles so that you can um, show what you view. So if you, now when you're done adding these, you go to the preparation mode, go to combat and actions. So now you got kind of a little section where you can keep track of what you've used. So if I use a candle, I just click on it and it just shows here that I've used it. And then like, let's say I ate some food. And then if you use the holy water or the potion, it'll disappear off your list because there's only one. I'm going to also add functionality to the potion. So it's just a note at this point. But if I want to actually add the, the syntax to it, you go to the inventory, pull up the Potion of Healing. Let's take a look at it. So Potion of Healing, pull up the description, provided that it's been identified. And here's the information about it. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to my Actions tab. And under Potion of Healing, if you click on this little thing here, or actually, is that the right, the Actions tab? Yeah, so. If I click on this potion of healing, there's nothing there. There's no description whatsoever. So I'm going to copy over this stuff here so I have that. So this way I don't have to go all the way back to the inventory just to look that up. Control A, Control Copy, and then Control V. So now I have the description. So now when I go to click on this as a player or the GM, and I need to know what the heck it is or what it does, there's the notes for it. Now the actual 2d4 plus two hit points. So I'm gonna right click on the potion, go to add action and then add effect or add heal in this case. And then under that, there's another line here. So I'm gonna open up that and I'm gonna put 2d4 plus two. So all you have to do is grab one of the dice on the desktop right click and that adds two and drop it in here and then you're going to put two for the bonus so 2d4 plus two so now you added a healing function to it so it's more convenient to use the potion so before you um you know use it you're going to drag and drop the effect on your character 
and then you can click on the use button there. So if I go to, um, it's like, for instance, here's the heal function. So when it's in the combat, let's say I got 11 wounds. Okay, so if I'm going to drink the potion, instead of having the GM have to monkey around with it, I can just say, okay, I want to use my healing potion on my turn. Drag and drop that onto your character. Okay, it healed eight points total. And now I can click on that little pip there, the little circle, and it disappears off the list. So that's kind of a way to keep track of what you used and also add more functionality to it. It's It takes a little bit to get used to doing that, but that is something that you, know, that you might do. And if you want to bring it back, you can always click the mode back here to standard and just uncheck it and it'll come back. So this would assume that you've replaced it or that you've gone shopping and you know that you've bought some more candles so maybe you topped off your candles and your food you know that sort of thing but in in um, combat and actions mode it's going to show your actual so let's take a look at the holy water so you can see here i don't have any description because this is kind of an added thing but if you go over to your inventory and you go to holy water let's bring that up you might want to see if if there's anything in here so yeah it does damage so let's see let's go to the um let's unlock that and let's go to the actions and let's first put these notes in our holy water area so copying and then pasting over here into the description so now we have that so now when I pop that up, we'll have a description of it. So as an action, you splash the contents of this flask onto a creature within 10 feet or within five feet of you. You can throw it up to 20 feet, shattering it on impact. So what we're going to do with that is put holy water and in, in parentheses, we can put 20 feet. So we remember where exactly, uh, how, how far it could go. Because it's now it's kind of like a thrown item. Uh, let's see, in either case, make a ranged attack against a target creature, treating the holy water as an improvised weapon. If the target is a fiend or undead, it takes 22d6 radiant damage. The ritual will take you can take a, you can create holy water by performing a special ritual. It takes an hour to perform and use the functionality. So if I right click on it and go to add action i'm going to first add the cast button which is essentially how you're going to you know use it for your targeting and such and i'm going to open this up and it's basically the type of attack is a ranged attack and that's it that's all i'm going to do so you, it gives you an ability to use it as a thrown item and then what we're going to do is that way you can you know attack someone with it and then we're going to also right click add action and this time this will be the damage and we're going to add that damage so it was 2d4 or 2d6 radiant so i'm going to grab a six-sided right click to add the additional die and then we're going to type radiant so that is going to add radiant damage to the holy water so there you go. So now you have two functional items in your inventory, and they're not just notes. So this, you have a cast where you can actually, you know, you can drag and drop it onto one of your enemies to see if it hits. And then if it does, then you drag the damage onto your target. So that's a kind of a nice way to, to have this. You can also do this with candles, like if you just don't want it to be a note. You can take the, the information from the item in your inventory. So let's go to candle. And this is what it says. It's one hour, five foot radius, and dim for an additional five feet. So you can go control copy and then control V. So this way you have you know your description of your candle in, in the inventory. So that this way, when you're tracking your candles and you click on it, you have a description and you don't have to, you know, look it up again. 
And then the other thing you can do is add the actual syntax for the lighting. So if you go to right click, go to add, add your um, action and then go to add effect, what we're going to do is add the lighting effect. So we're going to say candle with a semicolon. So, and then targets, we're going to leave that in case you have maybe on a surface, but we'll leave it on targets. And now we have to come up with the correct syntax. So to kind of see what that should look like, what you want to do is come over here under the options and look at effects. There is a light effect, a candle effect here. So if you take this and drag and drop it onto your character, it says light colon five foot candle. So that's what we want to put here. So we're going to put in capital letters, L-I-G-H-T colon five candle. Okay, so we just added functionality to your candles in your, from your inventory. So now when you do this, you would drag this to your, you know, to your character if they're if they're holding it, or if you lit it for another person, you can drag it to them, whoever's carrying it at that point, and that would give the light effect to that particular individual. When, once it's done, and you're done with the candle effect, you can drop it. Now you do have to put it in rounds, not hours. So it did say one hour. So in this candle, if I go back into and edit it there's a duration. So you have to put 600 rounds and it sounds goofy, but I mean, there is a spot for hours, but it won't track in this particular combat tracker with hours. It only works in rounds. So you have to convert it to rounds, but that's basically what you do with, with, with the light source. So those are just some things you can do to kind of make your, your uh, character a little bit more polished and complete. And one thing I do like to do that for as a GM for my players is, for instance, Spiritual Hammer. Let's take a look at that. So you have the spectral weapon, and it kind of has that shape. Does it have any light? Let's see. It's a bonus action. So not really. But what I would do with this is put, like, a little bit of light to make it glow or something like that. And what you can do is find out like what the color for blue is or yellow or whatever color you want it to be. And then um, just assign it to yourself, a light effect. And then you can use, turn that on when you're using the Warhammer or you can drag it to the token you're going to use for your, for your item. So there's all kinds of cool stuff, but the GM can take the time and put those in the effects area and just make it a custom effect or a custom, you know, like up here, you can make your own effect. So you can do that, or you can actually go into, if you go into the settings as a GM, and then you go to token lights, you can make up your own. So these are token lights that you could put on a token. But you can make your own, like you can make spiritual hammer one, if you want. Or whatever, uh, fairy fire is another one. So... That might be something you want. So anything that you want to have some kind of light on, you can do that. And then it says either purple or blue. So you can decide, you know, what what the color of the lighting is. And then it tells you, you know, whatever the spell description gives you. So it might see, let's see, we got that in our inventory, I believe. Yeah, so fairy fire. Uh, we had scorching ray twice. We don't need that. A fairy fire. So if you open this up, it says a 20 foot cube. It's outlined with green or violet or blue. Any creature in that area. And then it, it says uh, it affected the duration objects. The creature shed dim light in a 10 foot radius. So you can do that. And what you do is drag that fairy fire onto your out or enemy in this case to kind of outline them. So you could do that. So you would put your bright light uh, let's see, 10 foot shed dim light in a 10 foot radius. So what you do is your dim light, you could put 10. And then this would be that the tag would be fairy fire. And the duration would be up to the spell. So one action. I don't think we need to mess with it. 
probably just one round. It's, if it fails to save, yeah, we won't put that on there because you'll have to remove it manually, depending on how the, the individual, uh, if they save or not. But nonetheless, you could do something like that. And then what happens is when you cast a spell, uh, you'll be able to drag that effect onto your target if you're the, you know, you're the individual with that spell. So what I might do with Fairy Fire is right click, add an action, add this effect onto there, do it down here instead. And then that way it's more convenient and the player has it right there at their fingertips. But anyway, so this is starting to get into the, into Nomad's land here, but you get the idea. Um, So that's just a, you know, making this work. So this is a, a kind of a detailed character that's going to be used in Ravenloft. And it kind of planned it out in using ChatGPT. So we got most of the stuff right. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, kind of a good way to, to build this character. And then for like personality stuff, we can take all this, all these notes that we made, copy those and go back to the character and go put it in the notes area select why is it why did it do that okay hit control v okay so this is just a you know your personal personal details so here's your appearance so we can take this stuff you know and add it to here if we want and this is all the notes and updates so this is just a kind of a way to make this a little simpler on you but I think that's all I got. It was a little bit, maybe a little bit much, but basically planning the character uh, using the character wizard, you do have to go back and make some changes occasionally, especially when it comes to spells and that sort of thing and equipment. And then you can utilize the power of Fantasy Grounds once you get used to it and you learn the base functionality. Then you can start adding all that other fancy stuff. Those are more like quality of life changes are not required to play the game. They just make it a little quicker and easier. If you got a good game master, they're going to know what to do, and they'll help you with that.